Good morning. It is a good morning this morning, and uh, so thankful for that reading, Jamal. I think that was, you did a great job in that, and uh, made me think of something from it that, that, that hit differently at the second service than at the first, but it's until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to maturity. You know, this, this unity that we have is not just at this location. Uh, I'm reminded of that. We have many of our visitors that are here this morning. So great to see Jonathan Stroud and his family that, that, that can, have come from Savannah, Georgia. And, and uh, I did not realize that our youth had been, well, I knew we went to Savannah last year, the youth group with the, uh, the campaign, but a part of, of their congregation. And we went to Camp Nagehi together for years and years. And so uh, and it was wonderful having that reminder this morning. And what a blessing we're able to, to come together to worship God in spirit and in truth. And we realize that what God has done is He's built the church that is universal. And I'm so thankful. This is building off of our focus last year or last week and how God through this year is God works. God works through the church. And the focus we're going to look at this morning is that God builds His church. In Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 4, we're told that every house is built by someone. But the builder of everything is God. And if you'll notice, another thing that was in, this, in, the, in the passage that Jamal read for us, it was this equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. So we know that every house is built by someone. The builder of everything is God. God is building up his house. And notice this word for building up here in verse 12. It's, uh, it's actually, in the original, it's two Greek words combined. It's oikodome. And oikos is the word for house. Dome is where we get dome. So it's the roof. And so this word for building up, it, is, it, it combines all four walls and the roof. That the building up cannot be completed until we are watertight and airtight. You know, many people have been thankful for their roofs the last several days. Have we not? We're thankful for it right now. That we can worship God in the dry. That is a blessing. Uh, but the idea that God has built us up, it means that He's completed His task. When God builds his church, it's already built. But for us, this day, it's to be understood within the mind and heart and soul of every single person. God is still building it through you and through me. Because his church is not a building, it is his people that we're going to focus on. But we're going to look at several ways that God builds his church today. And I've got a picture that I'm going to utilize for this. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a picture, I took a picture of it, but the time that I took it, it didn't look this good. And so this is, a, this is another picture of it, uh, but it's uh, Borneskateg is the name of this church building. And I mention the name because this is what we're going to be discussing tonight in the devotional. And so I'll explain what that means in Gaelic, but it is in the highlands of, of Scotland. It's on the Isle of Skye. And, uh, and so... This is one of the most beautiful spots. If you were to look behind the person taking the picture, it's the ocean. And beyond that is even more of the, of the, the highlands in the distance. It's a beautiful spot. But you can tell a few things from this that it's a church building. Uh, the shape of the window really does help. You understand that's a church building. But there's a few things missing, isn't it? There's no roof. And you can even see sky through the windows, not the Isle of Skye light because there's no there's no roof but there's also no fourth wall it has imploded and so what we're seeing here is it's a building that was built in 1810 and time and and well the lack of maintenance has caused it to just fall into disrepair and so we don't see this church building as one that is built we see it as one that is as has been torn down by time it's, it's fallen away. And so for us, this, the fact that this word is, is being built up and it includes the house and the roof, that, that means there's protection. That God has made it possible for us to have His church. 
that he's made it he's made it possible through the first and foremost his cornerstone. God builds the church with the cornerstone. Uh, in, in Matthew chapter 21, if you'll turn there with me, Matthew 21, the idea of a, of a cornerstone, and, and I have this picture here because you'll notice these are cobbled stones. But if you look closely at the, the, the stones that, that shaped the, the framing of the window, can you see a little bit different? Those are sandstone, and those have been shaped, and they're more like bricks. They have, they, they're a capstone so that it ties in all the other stones together. The cornerstone is meant to be this, this idea of an interlocking system so that all four walls are locked together. Uh, my, my, my wife's family, they're all from Arkansas, and, uh, and, and Mary's grandparents and her parents lived on the same plot of land. In fact, their, 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 their land is just divided by grass, but on, on the, the middle of the property, there is a retaining wall for another property. And whoever did this, the brick mason, the way he did it is he placed the, the bricks this way to where they were, they were side by side. And then the, directly underneath them was the next layer, directly underneath them. And so it created a line throughout the entire thing. And you can look at these bricks and see that that is not how these bricks were laid. They are laid in an interlocking method. And see, this was a retaining wall, and it's meant to hold a lot of weight. It's about six feet of dirt that needs to be held there. And after decades, this retaining wall is no longer retaining. What happens is it's actually spread out about two feet beyond where it was originally placed because of time and, and the, the, the cold and, and hot and, and water and just the weight has pushed it away. Why? It's not strong. So a cornerstone, if you look at this idea of the interlocking, when it comes to the corners, there is a lock that comes from the corner that holds it in place. Jesus is our cornerstone. In fact, Jesus himself mentions this in Matthew chapter 21 and verse 42. And it shows that this means that it will be strong and it will not fall. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scripture the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruit. Jesus is referring to the Gentiles are going to be coming into the church. That means all people, not just the Jews. The Jews were there to prepare us for walking with God again. And so we understand that we need grace, we need mercy, and we're able to be a part of the kingdom of God. This is what Paul was talking about in Ephesians chapter 2, if you'll turn there with me. Ephesians chapter 2. And uh, we're going to look at verse 19 beginning. He says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, so you being He's talking to the Ephesian Christians, they're, they're mostly Greeks. He says, you, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. In whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. And so God has meant for us to have a dwelling place. For us to be joined together, to have this unity of mind, one in Christ, so that we're being built up. So that we're protected, that we have, we have four walls and a roof. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 6, Peter is discussing the same idea. And he says, For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe 
But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. The two examples that we have, the picture behind me and the, the, the retaining wall that's not retaining very much at uh, my in-law's property. You can choose to, to build not according to that standard and the result is the retaining wall fell. That's what happened. It finally fell. And uh, it's interesting that where my, my father-in-law, my, my in-laws live, the, the retaining wall there was built the exact same way. It was built by the same builder. He decided he was going to build retaining walls against that kind of standard. And every one of them has had to be dug out and built back right. What's interesting is this, this, this fourth wall that fell. This was, a, this was a church building where uh, when, we were, when we were over there, we spent a week up on the Isle of Skye. And the thing was, there were no churches that were, that were still there on the Isle of Skye. And we knew this, so we brought the provisions in order to be able to have the, the Lord's Supper. Well, there is a law that's been passed. Just so you know, we were not trespassing. It's called the right to roam. And so we were able to go into this building, even though we didn't own the the cattle farm that was surrounding it. It's because that wall was gone. Guess what the cattle used it for? A windbreak. They were able to get in there. In fact, several of them had been in there when we went in that morning and of Sunday morning and we had our worship service sitting there in the middle with no roof and one wall missing. But we just looked at the ocean and we, I had a lesson ready. We sang together and uh, the cows moved along. But... But what I noticed was this one corner on the other side, was, it was completely gone. See, what's happened is there, there was something that didn't quite interlock. And I was talking to David Danger after this. These are field stones, the majority of them. And so those field stones were then used by a stonemason to be placed there. And... Most of them, they would go down to the ocean, they would go down to the beach side, and they would get shells and all sorts of things, crush those up, and that's how they got their lime mortar. But you've got all of the storms, and that's on the side that's facing the ocean beyond that. And so what's interesting is it just absolutely just, just wore away at that corner. And that cornerstone that wasn't there, it wasn't put in properly, it wasn't protected, it wasn't taken care of. It wasn't being continually built upon. And it crumbled. It fell down. So we need to realize that Jesus is a cornerstone that is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's always there. But we've got to make sure we understand what Jesus taught. We've got to understand that, that what we're striving to do is be, be, be joined together, not in His name only... In, in maybe that, that phrase, what would Jesus do? So often it's left to, up to us as to what Jesus would do. But we can study his word and must study his word to find out what he would do. And it transforms our lives so that while we're fitting within that wall, we're going to stay strong. And that it's not based on just his name, it's based on his teaching that he came Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And so we cannot be a part of anything if it's not based on Jesus as our foundation. And we understand in verse 9, he says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own possession. In other words, a peculiar people. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Being able to be inside the household of God means we're out of the darkness and we're in the light. And so God has provided this and it's God that's building his church and he's made it to where he's chosen Jesus as that cornerstone. But the builders rejected but not all builders have rejected Jesus as the cornerstone. We understand that God continues to build His church through the builders. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, that, was, that Jamal read for us. 
I'm going to read 11 and 12 again. It says, He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to the equip the saints, to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ. So this is saying that apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers are the builders. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he says, I laid like a skilled master builder a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let us each take care how we build upon it. We have a responsibility in this list to be careful how we build upon that foundation. See, not only did the cornerstone provide the strength for all four walls and the roof so that we're being built up. But it also sets the standard for where the line is set. And Jesus is that line. Jesus is that standard. And so we need to watch that line and toe that line to understand what Jesus wants for on, his, on this rock he builds his church. Remember in Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said that to Peter. He said, who do men say that I am? Some say Elijah, one of the prophets. But Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God he said, blessed are you, Simon, son of John, for flesh and blood is not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church. That's the confession that Jesus is Lord. And if the confession that Jesus is Lord is the foundation, then we're going to follow our Lord, not expect the Lord to follow us. And so as the builders, we're following the cornerstone. The builders have the guidelines. That are given. And that's right here. If you look at verse 15. It says, Rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. From whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Notice the word equipped is mentioned again. Verse 12 that these apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers equip us for the work of ministry. And that we're now equipped and we're held together, joined together, when each part works properly. That building that we looked at, well, something happened to where it wasn't working properly and it fell down and the roof was imploded. But you'll notice it's the teacher's who teach about the cornerstone. It's the teachers who train us to understand who Jesus is and what He did and what we are expected to do in life. You know, after this service, we're going to have a special luncheon for our teachers, a teacher's appreciation lunch. Why do we have those? Because we, we appreciate our teachers. I want you to stop and think about who was the teacher that helped you? Who was the teacher that was an influence in your life? Maybe it was your grandmother. Maybe it was your grandfather. Maybe it was a high school teacher. Maybe, maybe it was a Sunday school teacher who just really helped you along the way. Maybe it was Camp in Agehi. Maybe it was an opportunity for you to... To, to learn the fundamentals of the gospel of Christ, and it was someone who taught you. You know what I found was interesting is we went into that, that, that building. We shooed away the cows, but other things were still shooing. <laughs> they smelled there. Uh, that were left inside that building. And, uh, and I started noticing, well, there's a bunch of grass that's, that's grown up. And it's the height of the... The, the, the floor was much higher than the pasture surrounding. And I got to looking and I noticed it was actually, it was the roof. It was the old slates. It was the old, it was the old cobbles. It was, the wall had fallen inward. I was, we were standing on top of the stones that were already there. And so what was interesting is we worshipped on the foundation of what came before and it makes me think about the, the, the fundamentals that our teachers have taught us. What would, why did they teach you? Did they teach it to you to go in one ear and out the other? 
Did they teach you to where they would always be the teachers? No, because teachers eventually pass on the baton, do they not? And to whom much has been given, much will be required. You know, on October 6th, we're going to, the elders have, have decided we're going to have a, uh, an, an involvement day. We're going to be looking at things in which we are, are, are willing to be involved in. And one of those could be a teacher. Because teachers, they teach students that students turn into teachers who then teach new students who are meant to teach <laughs> teachers and so on and so forth. That's how the, when each part is working properly with what it has been equipped, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. It's meant to be something that is continued so that it just builds itself up in love. And I wanted to mention that what I mentioned, the early service I'm going to mention now. You know, sometimes I think in the teacher's rotation, the Bible, Bible teachers, sometimes I, I, I feel like it's, it's maybe the moment you become a teacher, it's something you're going to do till the day you die. It's thought to be that way. But what we're doing, we're, we're actually striving to do some things that are a little different. You know, on Wednesday nights, now that our summer series is done, we have opportunities on Wednesday night for the devotional. We have Sunday night devotionals. And we're asking men of the congregation, you know, uh, Jeffrey, me, you know, you know, I'll be the default teacher on Wednesday night. But I want to encourage you, if, if you're interested in teaching, come talk to me. If you're interested in maybe taking on a devotional, it can be a one and done. And if it's something that it's, it's, it's challenging for you, that's, it's, it's done. But what, what's interesting is you can may find that by doing that, it's one step toward teaching. On vacation Bible schools, we specifically ask for men of the congregation within, uh, within the adult class to teach each night. It's again a one and done. We're doing Sunday night lessons and we're asking men of the congregation to fulfill one topic. Take on one, two, three topics. And that helps in, hey, you're not, you're not with an entire quarter. But that's how you maybe could get to that point. So I want to encourage you to think about those things. We've got some time before October 6th. I want you to think about how you could maybe get involved toward taking what a teacher has instilled in you and returning it. Helping somebody else. Because that's all that this is. That we're just returning what has been given to us. We were worshiping that day on top of the stones that came before. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6, it kind of gives us an example of what, why we have the teacher. And I put 6 there, but I actually I like for us to look at verse 5 beginning. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. He's talking about teachers here. He's saying teachers are simply servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. And so a teacher was there to help you along the way. Then he says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. See, we're just servants through whom you believed. It's God who gave the growth. So neither he who plants or he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. We're simply asking for facilitators to help in learning who Jesus is, who the foundation is. And what I have found is the more more I teach, the more I learn things. The greatest student is the teacher. Because what's happening is you're getting it to a point where you can relay it, and it's going in. And, and I, I tell you, there was, a, there was something going on at Freed Hardeman where uh, when, I was, when I was there, they would say, make sure that you have a study that's on your own, that's just for you, that you're not going to teach. And I never really liked that because I have felt that the, the lessons you're putting together to teach, as a result, are teaching you. If it's not teaching me, then why are you listening to it? You don't want to listen to it. And so we need to understand that, that we're, we're all just we're all students of God. Jesus is the cornerstone. But we need builders. 
We need builders who are willing to implement the teaching of Jesus so God provides the increase. So neither he who plants or he who waters is anything but God who gives the growth. Verse 8, he who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. We're simply working together. But then he says, you are God's field, God's building. The fact that you and me, the church, we are God's building, that, that would tell me that we're the final point. We are spiritual stones. God builds his church with spiritual stones. Stones. If you'll turn back here with me in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, beginning. He says, As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So how are you being built up? Through Jesus Christ. So the fact that he's the cornerstone, it's literally what builds you up and helps us get to a place where we weren't before. And it's, it's interesting, I, I remember when I was, I was 17 uh, I was 17 years old, and I started going in the adult Bible class when I was in, in high school. And I, I sat with, um, I've mentioned before, I, met, I sat with John Budd and Mike McCullough. They're in their 80s. I sat next to them every single time. I learned a lot from those men. Well, somebody noticed that I was, you know, sitting in there, and, and they said, you know, we're needing a teacher for fifth grade. And I was like, I had made a decision at that time. I'll say yes, and I'll, I'll, I'll cry about it later if somebody asks me. And that was, I never told anybody, but they somehow figured it out. But what happened is someone said, a, a lady came to me and said, would you want to teach the fifth grade? I was 17. And I said, sure. <laughs> Terrified me. But I found that teaching fifth graders was something I thoroughly enjoyed. But I was still going to go to school and be an artist. I wasn't planning to do Bible. I wasn't planning to do those things. But it was Graham McDonald that came and asked me when I was a sophomore in, in, in college to come and work in Scotland and, and, and run a youth outreach. And I found out that, you know what? God is pointing me in a direction I need to be teaching. But if it wasn't for that, that lady that asked me to, to, to teach, if it wasn't for, for, for John Budd and Mike McCullough and their influence in my life, where would I be? Where would you be without that one teacher? Return the teaching and help somebody else. You might say, well, how could I do it? Well, that's what I said. We just never know what God has in store. But we understand that God has given us His kingdom. He's given us the responsibility into our hands, the gospel is given, into our hands is given the light. Haste, let us carry God's precious message. That's what we're here to do. The final passage I'd like to look at is verses 1 through 3 of the same opening. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. If indeed you've tasted that the Lord is good. If you've tasted that the Lord is good, then you've been able to grow up into salvation. But what's interesting is we are to long for the pure spiritual milk. Sometimes we need the foundation. We need to be reminded of why we're doing what we're doing, why we're here who is our cornerstone? Jesus. Whose church is it? His. He's building His church. But Notice it says, put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy. Do you know, these are field stones that built this building all the way back in 1810. Those field stones were either buried, probably from, from the tilling, they, they found them covered in dirt. You know what the 
The mason would have to have done, he would have had to wash off the dirt, wash off the clay for their mortar to be able to stick. Do you know what? God provides a way for us as spiritual stones to have the dirt, the clay of sin to be completely washed away. And that is putting off the old self, putting away the malice, the ill will, the deceit, the hypocrisy, the envy, and all slander like newborn infants. We become newborn children of God. We become born again. So we must confess that Jesus is Lord. He's our cornerstone. And since He's our cornerstone, then we can be built up as a spiritual stone. We have an invitation that we're offering this morning to make sure that if any of the, the dirt of this life is, is stuck to you, that He's giving us a way to have it washed away. And we understand that the, the dirt, when it is removed, the sin, when it is removed, that we are added to the body of Christ. When Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, we understand that sin is removed. But on verse 41 of Acts 2, we know that they were added to the body that day. 3,000 souls. Have you been added to the body of Christ? We have an invitation that's for you. But maybe you have been, but you've allowed cares of this world. You've allowed the time and, and, and just, just the, the, the filth of this life to start wasting away from your spiritual stone. And if you look at this picture, we have one corner that's absolutely held up. But then on the other side, we have a lot of stones that are out back in that field that used to be there. And I don't know where, where you are this morning, but God makes it possible for you to be cleansed. God makes it possible for you to be held strong. You know that it's going to just a matter of time for that corner to fall if it stayed in that, that state. If we can encourage you, if we can pray with you, don't stay in that state. If you have a need, please respond now while together we stand and sing. Uh, yeah.